Live from Gotham City, it's the Bat Podcast. I'm Pat the Batman Fan. Welcome back to another exciting episode of the show. First of all, I want to apologize for my voice. I've been sick as a dog for about a week. That's why the podcast is a little late this month. I have just had the worst cold you can imagine. I've never been this sick before. Something's going around, so make sure you drink lots of fluids and take your bat vitamins. Stay healthy. Before we start today, I want to give a quick plug to a a movie I just saw recently. It's a documentary called Legends of the Night. It's an amazing film. It's about how Batman has inspired people in their lives to overcome physical disabilities, help other people make their lives better. It's just a tremendous achievement, and I want to give a shout out to them. Again, it's called Legends of the Night, and you can check out their website at wearebatman.com. Com. You can check out and see if there's a screening nearby you, or you can actually request a screening in your town. Highly recommend you check it out. You can also buy a copy of the film on Blu-ray or DVD there. Definitely support it. It's a must for any Batman fan, or really anybody, because it's a magnificent piece of work. And if you don't have a little tear in your eye at the end, then... <laughs> Something's wrong with you, because it's very inspiring. Okay, so let's start the show, shall we? Release the bats. Most people recognize Bob Kane as the sole creator of Batman. His name has appeared thusly on all of the Batman comics since the character debuted in 1939, and all of the live-action and animated movies give him credit as the creator of Batman. But there has long been talk of another creative force, one obscured by Bob Kane's shadow. His name was Bill Finger, and insiders have long whispered that he deserves just as much credit for the Batman as Bob Kane. According to some, Bill Finger was primarily responsible for much of the Batman mythos and character, including, among other things, the look of the costume, several key characters, including Commissioner Gordon, and even the name Gotham City. Kane's credit as sole creator of the Batman has remained widely undisputed for over 70 years. But recently, the veracity of his claim has come under close scrutiny, thanks in large part to a children's book written by my guest on the show today, author Mark Tyler Nobleman. His book, entitled Bill the Boy Wonder, tells Bill Finger's story and gives one of the Batman universe's greatest heroes the acknowledgement he never received while he was alive. It is a fantastic and eye-opening book and a must-read for any Batman fan. So without further ado, let's talk to my guest, Mr. Mark Tyler Nobleman. What do you say, Mark? Are you ready to dive right in? Shall we? Let's do it. All right, so when did you first hear the name Bill Finger? You know, I've been asked that before, and I wish I remembered. All I know is that I have been a superhero fan since I was a kid, And when I grew up and became a writer and recalled the stories of Siegel and Schuster uh, and noticed that no one had done a book, a standalone biography of the creators of, you know, one of the most popular fictional characters in world history, that was a huge opportunity to combine my passion with, you know, some marketing strategy, some, you know, filling a gap in the market. And after doing that book called Boys of Steel, which came out in 2008, well, not after, after I'd sold it in 2005, it seemed a natural companion follow-up to do a book on Batman, which, you know, the story was even more tragic, frankly, I guess you could say. Not only that, but even less covered than the Superman story. So it was, it, you know, my, my goal was to tell the, the real-life Batman origin story from the proper perspective for the first time in history, officially. I mean, you know, Bill Finger's mentioned in other books, but if you really strip it away and step back and look at this story, this is Bill Finger's story. This is his creative heavy lifting, and he's always relegated to, you know, he's marginalized, but he's really the focus of the story, so that's why I did this book. Um, I mean, it's just, it's not revisionist at all. I mean, it's just telling the story properly um, after Bob Kane's 75-year myth. Now, how long did it take you to write the book? Because you did a lot of research for this. Yeah, I did. And it was far more than I expected to be doing and also a lot more than a lot of people, you know, had seen before with this kind of book, with a, you know, book that is not exclusively for young people, but including them. 
it's a, it's, a, it's a picture book. It's accessible to young people, and I speak and I promote it heavily to kids, but it's really for everybody. So people were, some people were, you know, surprised that I did all this research and then produced a book like that, uh, whereas, of course, you know, me as an author for young people and everyone like me has very long defenses for why writing a book in this format is just as valid and important as anything else. But um, it did take a lot of research, and I started in 2006. And that first year and a half was the heavy period. And then, uh, to be honest, I'm still researching it. I mean, the book's been out for more than a year, and I still post about it on the blog and speak about it. And as new information comes up, I continue to tell the story in a multimedia format. I don't think I'll ever stop researching, and I'm hoping that having being this presence online with, you know, as a Bill Finger person, that people will continue to email me as they find this, and they have done this, and say, oh, I knew Bill's family, or I have this photo, or I know this story, and when I hear these, get these things, I add them to the blog. So it's an ongoing process, actually. Right. Well, I'm glad that you did stick with the children's book format because it really works beautifully. Well, thank you. Um, I mean, it was never a question in my mind just because that's my background. It ended up being more sophisticated than your typical book in that format, and that was actually one of the reasons that the editor who published my Superman book did not want to do the Bill Finger book. She thought that it's skewed too old. Um, some people in children's publishing, I think, get nervous when they think someone's trying to promote a book to a wider market because they don't know how to do that or they feel it will dilute its impact, but I couldn't disagree more with that. Well, it's great, and I think it definitely can be enjoyed by both kids and adults. Well, thank you. I mean, I, I, you know, I wanted to be able to tell this story to any possible audience, and not that this is anything on the par of a, you know, a civil rights issue or a, you know, a, a huge you know, political, societal issue. This is one man's story. But, you know, I grew up not knowing who Bill Finger was. And, you know, Batman is, I mean, everything has to be, you know, channeled through the perspective or the, um, you know, the prism of Batman as Batman. I mean, he is, you know, he is the most lucrative superhero of all time by some estimates. And so, you know, this story happened to a lot of people. They got taken advantage of. But when you, you know, when you put it, when you overlay the fact that this is Batman, it becomes such a bigger story. And I wanted kids to grow up knowing that what they're reading or what they're seeing, even though they probably don't pay attention to the credit line, is not true. You know, whereas I learned it as an adult, and I just, you know, my job is to tell the truth in writing, and uh, I want kids to grow up knowing that you can read about someone that you look up to but don't fully, you know, don't have absolute um, respect for or admiration for because, you know, Bill Finger was a flawed individual, and he contributed to his own you know, not downfall, but his own, you know, you know, state in life. So it's important that kids know that not everybody that we that we admire is flawless, and that's what this book does. I mean, a lot of books in this format, you know, the the care the, the figure is is glorified at the end. Is is you know he succeeds at the end. You know, Ben Franklin or Muhammad Ali or Rosa Parks. You know, they have struggle, but in the end they succeed. This story, you know, he kind of failed. But, right. you know, it's, a, it's, it's the Batman story, so it's very important that we teach kids that, look, you can work hard, be, be very good at what you do, and, you know, and still it's, it's up to you to let make sure people don't take advantage of you. Well, that's a very good lesson, and it does fill in a very important part of the Batman history. You know, because I had, as big a fan as I am, I had heard the name Bill Finger. I was aware he was an artist, but until I read your book, I really had no idea of the scope of the story. So, again, great job with that. Thank you. And one of the most amazing things you uncovered uh, from your research is the discovery that Bill actually has a living heir that was previously unknown to any of the powers that be. Yeah, that was a hugely significant moment in the research and could have an effect on pop culture history, frankly. People thought that Bill Finger had no heir. They thought that he died with one son, uh, one known child, who was a son named Fred, and he died in 1974. Fred died in 1992. Fred was gay. Mm -hmm. And so when I started my research, the implication was there, is, there are no more fingers. And, you, you know, I can write a book. I can speak about it around the world. And try to raise awareness and the groundswell for this man's legacy, but legally I can't do anything. However, if you're an heir, you are, you know, you have the legal status to negotiate or deal with this issue and try, hopefully maybe even see, you know, see a change. 
so the heir, her name is Athena, and she knew who her grandfather was. It wasn't that I told her that, but she wasn't doing anything about it and didn't have any intention to. And it was, you know, this pushy writer that barged in and said, look, this is your birthright, and, you know, maybe you don't realize what you could try to do, and you might not realize how impactful this would be on not only your own family, but on fans who who are out there every day posting messages on message boards and tweeting that this man who they've never met and, you know, known very little about was taken advantage of. And there's a definite social justice component here. So she um, came around and, and, and is now thinking about options and what she can do. And she certainly has my support and probably the support of a lot of fans to try to do something in her family's name. Well, and hopefully a lot of the industry people will support that as well. It would be great if it was a world in which she could sit down with the powers that be and just talk this through and, and do the right thing. But obviously we all know that this is business and, you know, the, the management of DC Comics, whatever you want to say about them, they're products of modern world. They're enlightened people. Mm-hmm. If you sat down with them inf- informally uh, over a beer and said, you know, what do you think Bill Finger's legacy should be? I'm sure a lot of them would say, uh, yeah, he's co-creator of Batman. But, if, you know, it's not like they can just walk into the office and change that. And you had some pretty heavyweight people confirm what you said in the book. For example, Carmine Infantino and uh, Michael Uslan. Yep. And as a matter of fact, I talked to Neil Adams about your book. I mentioned it to him to see if he'd heard about it. And he was very interested in it. And he was very intense on the subject of Bob Kane. Oh, I'm sure. And I, I uh, appreciate you telling people like him about my book. Oh, absolutely. You know, what I tell people about the situation is that I feel, Bill Finger died in 1974, and Neil Adams began to go to bat for Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster in 1975, as far as I remember. Mm -hmm. I know that the settlement came down at the end of 75. So my feeling is that had Bill Finger survived, that Neil Adams might have turned his attention to Bill next as, you know, the second in line to this treatment. You know, but Bill was gone. I just I think that he might have done that, but obviously he Bill you know he was too late because Bill died. Well, you've done a great job helping to bring awareness to the issue of artists' rights, and if I sound like I'm gushing a little bit about uh, uh, your book here, Mark, well, uh, it's because I'm gushing. You did a tremendous job. Well, thank you, Pat. I I, I will accept your gush. It's very kind of you. Well, we mentioned you did a lot of research for the book, so uh, let's talk about some of the people you spoke to, including uh, the great Batman artist and former editor of DC Comics, Carmine Infantino. Why don't you tell us a little bit about that? You know, it was a huge honor. I, I in all honesty, was not, never a big fan of his artwork, although it, I, I've, it, it was a vivid part of my youth. I mean, I read The Flash, and his style is so distinct. That was my orientation, the 80s Flash I, I didn't particularly like it, but I, I could, you know, I remembered it vividly, and um, I didn't know how strong of a Bill Finger proponent he was. And then when I started the research, I didn't, you know, I didn't. I mean, I didn't think about him in particular. However, he turned out to be one of the most important people because he is un, he was unfiltered. He was uh, very strongly pro Bill Finger, and you know, very critical of people that denied Bill his due. And he was. A brave guy. I mean, because in the 70s, when he was publisher of DC Comics, he devoted two full pages uh, of dedication to Bill Finger in DC Comics publications, in which he very, you know, almost brazenly said that Bill is one of the fathers of Batman. I mean, he was as close to being a rebel as you probably could be in that context, I mean, by doing that. Kane was still alive, and, you know, I'm sure other people at the company, that probably made them nervous, and I don't, I would, I, you know, now that I think, I never asked Carmine if he heard from Bob Kane after that stuff. But if he did, he might not even remember. I mean, he was an old guy when I, by the time I got to him. But a generous man, and uh, I had a lot of sympathy for him, actually. I, I grew to really like him a lot. Yes, it was very sad to hear that he, he passed away recently, and I'm glad that you got to meet him. Yeah. I got to hand deliver a copy of the book to him. I don't know if you saw that on my blog, but that was something that was important to me to give a few of the key people copies in person, and I would have done it for Jerry Robinson, but he died six months before the book came out, unfortunately. Yes, and uh, Batman producer Michael Uslan tells a great story about Jerry, who, if our listeners don't know, is widely considered to be the creator of the Joker, and like Bill, he didn't really get the recognition he deserved in his lifetime for it, and Michael was able to bring him to the premiere of The Dark Knight, 
and when he had the attention of the paparazzi, he turned them on Jerry and said, hey, everybody, this is the creator of the Joker and got Jerry a really wonderful little moment in the sun there. Yeah. Let's take a minute and plug the amazing artist who did the fantastic illustrations for the book. Yes, Ty Templeton, fan favorite who, you know, I became exposed to as a Batman the Animated Series fan when he was drawing the, the spinoff comic in the, in the 90s. And he was, you know, passionate about the story as well. It wasn't just a job for him. He, of course, knew about Bill Finger and knew more than, you know, a passing reference to him. And he was, uh, you know, he threw all that into the book. So he was very, uh, you know, a pleasure to work with. I've still not met him in person or even talked on the phone with him. It was all done by email. But that's how these things go. And uh, I was very honored to have him on board. Now, obviously, you're a big superhero fan, Mark. Was Batman always your favorite superhero? No, actually not. Uh, I mean, I, I was always a DC fan. You know, Batman was in so much of what I read, but I was not, a, I wasn't, a Superman was more for me. And even Aquaman was probably higher on the list in, in general because I just like underdogs. Well, that is something you definitely don't hear every day. I know. Well, you know, my orientation, frankly, was Super Friends, and I watched Super Friends, and, you know, Superman and Batman were the marquee characters, and I, you know, I just, I mean, I tend to root for the underdog, and I like to, I just felt like probably there was greater challenge in writing something for Aquaman, and I guess I appreciated that. Well, on the subject of Super Friends, let's talk about your amazing interview project on your blog. Sure. Um, yeah, it's a series that you can Google by searching Super 70s and 80s. That's the name of it, and it's interviews with 100 people. It ended up being an even 100 people that were involved with superhero entertainment of my formative years, 1970s and 1980s. So, uh, you know, for me, the jumping-off point was the Super Friends segment, but there's also a segment on the SeaWorld water skiing superheroes, Superman the movie, and the cult 1979 TV show Legends of the Superheroes and a few other um, shows. So it was just, it's, as with a lot of things I do, it started off, as something that I thought I could do quickly and fairly easily, and that ended up being an, an, a, an enormous project because, you know, you're dealing with people in most cases who are in their 70s or, well, when it, when it, with respect to the Super Friends, these are people that, were, that are in their 70s or older that I'm trying to find, and they're not household names, and in many cases they have almost no online presence. So it's a challenge to try to find them, and then once you find them, it's sometimes a challenge to try to get them to understand what you're doing even though it's a very simple interview, but they might not understand blog or understand exactly who I am. I mean, you know, so it was it was definitely a challenge, but everybody agreed. And so I've got interviews with them all up there. And for me, the highlight of that was finding and interviewing the Wonder Twins, the actors who portrayed the Wonder Twins. And that would be Michael Bell and Louise Rodericks. Who was called Liberty Williams at the time. That was her stage name. You know, they're, they're such a, you know, love them or hate them touch point in, in superhero pop culture history. And so no one had ever interviewed them before about this. And, you know, Louise was completely off the map. I mean, she had just, you know, I, without Michael, I wouldn't have found her. And it was a really fun highlight to actually I was in L.A. and I got to meet them. We arranged this, that we would meet. Uh, we met and had a bite to eat um, one afternoon. And I, had, I took their picture posing somewhat like the Wonder Twins, and I gave them both a Wonder Twins T-shirt. I mean, they had no concept. Most of these people had no concept that anybody would care, that anybody would ever come around and interview them about this. I mean, to them it was essentially just a job. And they didn't stop to think, some of them, about the cultural impact or how there would be you know, people that grew up and still think about these cartoons. I mean, it, it took some, you know, explaining for some of these people to understand why people would care. But it was a blast to do that. Now, aside from superheroes, you ha also have a series on your blog on the video vixens of the 80s. Yes. You've got interviews with girls from videos from Journey, Huey Lewis and the News, and even ZZ Top's Legs, which is pretty much the gold standard for 80s video vixens. Well, let's face it, it's a natural follow-up to a series about superhero entertainers of the 70s, right? Makes perfect sense. Well, sure, because we watched the superheroes when we were younger, and then when we hit puberty, it was MTV and all the girls in the videos. That was all we had back then, uh, no internet. That was it, I know. That, I mean, I'm a huge music fan, rock and roll fan, and especially 80s and earlier. So that was um, another one of those things that I thought would be fairly straightforward. And, you know, and in a sense it is, because 
the uh, most time-consuming part of it is often just finding the people. Some of them have websites or Facebook pages, even though you don't know their names at first. Others are take a lot of digging, which I like. But then once I find them, if they agree, I, I, I just email them a list of questions, and they answer them on their own time at their own convenience, uh, you know, and then I have this great content. So, you know, it's not like I need to meet them, or which I've done, but I don't have to, or interview them over the phone, which takes more time. I just let them tell their story in their own words. And it provides this great content, which people are generally very appreciative for. I mean, people our age, my age, I'm 41, who wonder about these things, but it's not like you're going to see a book of this or even a magazine article because, you know, the way the media has gone, it's, it's just all so of the moment. You know, it's like, how is this hot now? So nostalgia stuff, you know, basically I think has, has moved over to the Internet, which means that it will live forever. You know, if this were something that was published in a book, not a lot of people would necessarily know about it who would be interested. And if it was a magazine article, even fewer people would see it, and then it would be gone. But on the Internet, it lives forever, and I can see how often people search and find these posts. It's definitely an evergreen topic, both of them, the superhero people and the 80s music video people. Absolutely. Now, like Batman, you have some pretty keen detective skills, Mark. Uh, was that? Have you always been a curious sort? Uh, well, I, you know, I, I'm, I am a curious type, and I ask a lot of questions. And my wife sometimes preempts that when we're meeting people for the first time at a party or at an event, and like, you know, someone says something that interests me, and my wife will say, "He's going to ask you a lot of questions now." So, yes, that's part of me, although I, it's never come out to the extent that it did with Build a Boy Wonder. I mean, the kind of research that I ended up doing was just not on my, on my radar. But it becomes addictive. You know, you realize I'm really, you know, walking down roads that no one's ever walked down and talking to people that have never been interviewed about this very seminal topic, you know, this huge cultural figure. And these are people that know something that nobody else knows and no one has ever asked them. So I felt it was an obligation to do this, you know, that I had to ask them a lot of questions and even when it was uncomfortable for me or for them. I mean, just try to get as much out of them as I can before they're gone. It ended up being very detective-like, and I was, it turns out I have a knack for finding people, and it doesn't always happen, but I found a lot of people that no one's ever found before. So, I did, you know, it just takes some pretty madcap uh, commitment. Well, madcap commitment and keen detective skills. Uh, Batman would be proud of you, sir. Mark, thanks for taking the time to come on the show today. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you, Pat. I really appreciate the time. And, uh, of course, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll stay in touch. Absolutely. And all you listeners out there can keep in touch with Mark as well. Check out his blog. It's always interesting stuff. Just Google Noble Mania, N-O-B-L-E-M-A-N-I-A. And you can follow him on Twitter at Mark T. Nobleman. You can also follow me on Twitter at Pat the Batman Fan, and be sure to check out the website batpodcast.com, and you can also follow me on Facebook there. And make sure you buy a copy of Mark's book, Bill the Boy Wonder. It is a must-read for any Batman fan. It's an incredible story. There's a link on the website at batpodcast.com to buy it off of Amazon. Can't recommend it enough. Well, that's the show for today. As always, our fantastic theme song is The Guardian by Whitewall. Uh, Join me next month when my guest will be none other than the amazingly talented and beautiful Adrian Barbeau, who, of course, was Catwoman on the Batman animated series. And we'll also talk a little bit with my bat buddy Larry from one of my favorite stores in the world, Blast from the Past in Burbank. Larry owns Blast from the Past. It's a tremendous collectible store, lots of fun Batman stuff. I spend way too much time in there, and Larry and I have some great conversations about Batman, so I thought, let's record them and let you guys listen to them as well. It's going to be a lot of fun. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next month live from Gotham City. 